Shalom and Shalom brothers. The title of this video is pretty much self-explanatory, but we are going to be going over the different tactics, the different tactics that they use to whitewash history and eradicate so-called black people. So with all of that being said, please subscribe, like the videos. Let's get straight into it. So we're going to kick this off with BX311. Now you might be asking to yourself, what is BX311? BX311 is a chemical solution that they use to fabricate artifacts, but we're going to read what they do. So BX311, the BX311 process is used to create a variety of brown, black, brown, and US 10B finishes. It produces consistent color day in and day out, and it's easier to relieve than other processes. BX311 gel, an instant acting swab on or brush process used to create a variety of brown, black brown and US 10B finishes formulated to work on vertical copper and copper alloy surfaces and create underlying red tones. When highlighting the brown tones, the BX311 gel can be applied with a brush, rag or a sponge. So basically, it creates like a brown, red or midish brown, like a complexion to whatever they put it on. But I'm going to bring it home when I bring out the artifacts. BX 312. This process for copper, brass, and bronze is perfect for creating more pronounced brown to chocolate brown tones and richer red tones when highlighted. Produces consistent color batch to batch. BX 312 gel. Instant acting process. Perfect for creating more pronounced brown to chocolate brown tones and richer red tones when highlighted so as we're reading these as you can see it adds a certain distinct color to whatever you put it on bx318 a ready to use solution that produces a ross patina in orange yellow and brown tones so keep that in mind brothers so these are the artifacts that uses those chemical solutions and this is how they create that fake aged look but we're going to read a little excerpt from the real history www.com so it reads fake roman bronze bust of a young white man the bust shows no normal bronze weathering the aged look is accomplished chemically such as with the product bx311 so the difference between the original and the fake. So we're going to read a little excerpt we have here. So it reads anatomy of an albino fake using as example, the Croatian Apoxiomenos. The Croatian Apoxiomenos is a bronze statue of an athlete. In 1996, a recreational diver came across a large bronze statue lying at a depth of 45 meters off the Croatian island in Lossin in the um, Adriatic Sea. This statue, which is thought to be a Hellenistic or Roman replica of a bronze original from the second quarter of the end of the fourth century BC, was recovered in 1999 by a Croatian archeologist and restored. Visual inspection of the original and supposedly restored, in quotation marks, heads, reveal many dimensional relationships which do not correspond. Most apparent is the following. Look on the right side. Notice the relationship between the ear, which is still well defined, and the hair. On the fake restoration, the hair sticks out further, is bigger. Then on the crud encrusted original, which, is, which should be the biggest because of all the crud on it. The restored head cannot be bigger in any respect than the crud encrusted original. That is not physically possible. Thus, what is called the restored head is a fake. And yes, brothers, when you hear the terms restored, refurnished, remodeled, so on and so forth, that is code word for fake artifacts.
So as you guys already know, one of their favorite things they love to do is to break up the noses and lips to make the statues and relics look racially ambiguous. Now they're going to tell you the reason why the noses and lips are broken up is due to religious reasons, which I'm going to cover later in this video. They're also going to tell you the reason why noses and lips are broken up is due to bad weather conditions. But what we're going to do, we're going to take a look at some of these statues and relics where the no uh, of the nose is broken off and then we're going to take a look at some of the statues where the noses have not been altered and we're going to see why they have to break off the noses and lips so this statue here as you can see the nose has been completely eradicated but as you can see this statue is still in such pristine condition you can see that the nose has been specifically targeted it must be that bad weather they keep talking about I don't know why it is with the bad weather and it seems to only target the noses and the lips but completely seems to miss all the other parts on the statue or maybe it's due to religious reasons but what the heck do I know right? I do not have a PhD and I did not graduate from Harvard. Look at this statue here. As you can see the nose has been completely decimated but once again brothers look at the statue it's still in pristine condition and the only part that has been broken off is the nose. Now why is that? Another statue or bust that is still in good condition and the only part that has been broken off is the nose. The same exact thing once again. Here's two examples here and as I'm sure you brothers already know the one to the right is the Sphinx. So brothers, this is Captain Henry Kingsmill and he was killed in the English Civil War under Charles. Now, as you can see once again, his nose has been completely desecrated, but I'm highlighting this dude for a reason. So brothers, pay attention to this dude's hairstyle. As you can see, he has the straight curled hair. Do not automatically attach that hairstyle to the Caucasian. Brothers, a lot of the European kings, dukes, nobles, so on and so forth, this is how they styled their hair and I'm going to show you a modern day example of that. So as I'm sure you guys already know, this is Snoop Dogg and Cat Williams. And as you can see, they have that straight parted hairstyle. Brothers, the same way our people perm and um, straighten their hair is the same thing that they were doing in their rulership in Europe. So brothers, this is Holy Roman Emperor Leopold I and as you can see he has the exact same hairstyle as Cat Williams and Snoop Dogg. There's nothing new with our people. The same way our people style themselves today is the same way our people style themselves in Europe during their rulership. And speaking of style, let's go tackle that. So take a look at this brother here. As you can see, he has on the fancy hat. He has on the golden earring in. His garments are fancy and as you can see, they're multicolored. And in his hand, he's holding a golden chalice. So where have we seen this before, brothers? The pimp. Now, as silly and as funny as this may seem, this is where a lot of the dress code comes from. Now, a lot of our people are going to think that this style comes from tokenism and black exploitation from like the 60s, 70s and 80s where they had the so-called black man dress up as a pimp and doing a lot of degenerate stuff which is partly true but this is not that that's not the only reason why the so-called black man dresses this way but a lot of our people do not know where certain things come from or originate because all they know is slave history but take a look at this pimp here as you can see he has on the fancy hat he has on the big chain around his neck he has on the diamond encrusted knuckle dusters. He has on the fancy, fancy greenish colors. And as you can see, just like in the other um, image that we just saw, he has the chalice in his hand. There's nothing new with our people, brothers. If you was to take this dude and put put him in med put him in medieval Europe, he will fit right in with the European nobility, especially the French. So when you see the black man wearing his big chain around his neck, where he likes to wear all his diamond earrings, where he likes to put all the rings on his finger, he likes to have the golden grill in his mouth. 
It's just how the so-called black man styles himself. It doesn't come from slavery or tokenism. Now the Caucasian wants you to think that because when you think that it gives the Caucasian power because it gives off the narrative that every, that your whole existence is based on the Caucasian, whether bad or good. So I kind of went off in a tangent, so let's get back on topic. So we took a look at some of the statues where the noses and lips have been disfigured. So now we're going to take a look at some of the statues where the noses and lips are still intact and why they have to destroy them because it's so obvious. So we're going to kick it off with this. So at the bottom it reads, Phoenician bust from the Phoenician, from the Phoenician period in Spain. And as you can see, the nose and the lips are very prominent. You see why they have to destroy them? Because it's too obvious. Ain't no one going to look at this and say that this is a Caucasian. This statue, at the bottom it reads, depiction of the god Osiris. And as you can see, once again, look how prominent the nose is. This huge head statue, as I'm sure a lot of you brothers are familiar with, at the bottom it reads, Olmec, colossal head in situ. And a lot of these Olmec heads are spread throughout South America. So this decorative wall art, and once again, brothers, as you can see, look how prominent the nose is. But at the bottom it reads, molded clay brick panel showing an Elamite goddess. Wall ornament of the temple of Inchushinak at Susa, 2000 BC. So this is an Egyptian pharaoh, and I'm probably going to butcher his name, but his name is Akhenaten, and he was an Egyptian pharaoh, um, and he ruled 1351 to 1334 BC. And it was the 10th ruler of the 18th dynasty. And as you can see from this bust, you ain't getting Caucasian from this. Chariot decoration, Western Zhou, 1100 BC. And for those, for those who don't know, Western Zhou is just basically China. So here is another um, Egyptian pharaoh. And I'm probably going to butcher his name also. So this is Sahu, Sahuri. Sahyo, however you pronounce it, and he was pharaoh, he was pharaoh of ancient Egypt and the second ruler of the fifth dynasty. So look at this Greek vase here, as you can see once again. Look how prominent the nose is, and yes, the original Greeks were also a dark-fleshed people. Now they're going to tell you when artifacts like these make mainstream media headlines. They're going to tell you that this was an African slave that was in Greece. This is what they do with artifacts and relics. If an artifact is found in Scotland, Scandinavia, England, China, Japan, Australia, so on and so forth, they're going to tell you that those were just slaves during that time period, not knowing what you are looking at is actually the indigenous and Aboriginal people of those lands. And you have to understand when the Edomites were in rulership, his kingdom was never was his kingdom was always a mixed multitude. For example, when Alexander the Macedonian took over Greece, it wasn't purely Caucasian. You had different races and demographics in those lands, and even our own people joined onto them willingly. Joined onto them willingly. For example, I'm going to use the U.S. military. Um, you have all types of races and demographics in the U.S. military. You even have transgenders in there. It was the same way during Rome and Greek, Rome and Greece, where the Edomites were in rulership. And you had different nations that willingly joined onto them. But I'm going to get how our people joined onto them. So this is the book of First Maccabees. Now this is where our people joined onto them. Now this is um after Alexander the Macedonian died and then his generals took over. So it reads, and after his death, that being Alexander, they all put crowns upon themselves. So did their sons after them many years and evils were multiplied in the earth. And there came out of them a wicked root, Antiochus, surnamed Epiphany, son of Antiochus, the king, who had been a hostage at Rome. And he reigned in the 137th year of the kingdom of the Greeks. Here we go. 
in those days went there out of Israel wicked men, who persuaded many, saying, Let us go and make a covenant with the heathen that are round about us. For since we departed from them, we, have much, we had much sorrow. So this device pleased them well. Then certain of the people who were, who were so forward herein, that they went to the king who gave them license to do after the ordinances of the heathen. And this is how our people became Hellenized. This is how our people became Gentiles. And this is the people that Paul was going to not the other nations so when you read stories about how paul was going into the gentiles he was going into his people the children of israel that were following heathenistic customs and regrafting them back in and even before then a lot of our people got scattered during the different captivities and the different migration patterns that they went to brothers even before the medieval period our people was all, our people were in europe so during the time of King Solomon, where he went off worshipping other gods, the Mosai split the kingdom in two. He had the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. Now the southern kingdom consisted of um, Judah, Benjamin and Levi. And the northern kingdom consisted of Ephraim, Gad, Naphtali, Manasseh, Reuben, Asher, Simeon, Zebulon and Ishakar. And as I've stated, our people went into different captivities, mainly the northern kingdom. For example, the Assyrian captivity, the Persian captivity, the Greek captivity, Roman captivity, so on and so forth. And this is, how, this is how our people, particularly the Northern Kingdom, ended up in those lands. And they were in places like Sicily, Rome, Thessalonia, Philippi, Corinth, Asia, Pontus, Galatia, Ephesus, Egypt, Syria, so on and so forth. Now, the reason why these may sound familiar to you, because... These were some of the places where Paul was sending his letters to, to his people. To regraft the northern kingdom and spread the word of Yahawashai. Now you guys should go watch um, Tribe Judah teach because he does an excellent job of explaining that the Gentiles, that the Gentiles are Israelites. Now you're not going to find it on his main page. You're going to have to type in the Gentiles are Israelites part one. Now if I don't forget, I will leave the link in the description in the description so let's get back to the relics so here are two statues found in greece and no they are not african slaves that were founded in greece like they're going to tell you here is a greek vessel and at the bottom it reads greek vessel in the form of a youth licking his lips 400 bc and these are two greek silver coins they really like putting their black African slaves on their currency, don't they? So since I brought out some of the Canaanite and Egyptian statues, I just want to reiterate, so-called black people, you are not the ancient Egyptians. And when I use the term so-called black, I'm talking about the Israelites. And if I'm using the term so-called black for the other dark races of people, I'm going to make a distinction like I'm going to do now. Now you see these people in the background behind the Caucasian, these would be your akin to the ancient Egyptians. Now these people are the Dinkas. They inhabit South Sudan, the Nile Bank and parts of Ethiopia. Now a lot of them got pushed out of their lands by the different Ottoman Turks and the Turkish tribes who are claiming the identity of the Egyptians. Like these people here. These people are not the original Egyptians. These are Turkic people who are claiming the identity of the Egyptians. This is why whenever you see um, Hollywood movies or TV shows, if, the, if they don't outright show Caucasians, they're going to show you these type of people to fill those roles in. And neither one of them are the original Egyptians. So going back to the Nihilatic people, now the Caucasian is going to tell you the reason why these people are so tall is because of evolution and that they adapted to their lands. Brothers, the reason why these people are so tall is because they descend from the sons of Ham. The sons of Ham were always known for being a tall in stature people. For example, when you read the scriptures, when the children of Israel were scouting out the land of Canaan, now I'm going to roughly paraphrase because I don't remember it fully off the top of my head, 
But when they were scouting out the land, they were afraid, some of them, because of their tall, tall in stature in nature. So instead of me trying to paraphrase it, I remember off the top of my head, I'm just going to get to the point. So this is the book of Numbers 13, but I'm going to um, skip down to 30 to get to the point. Now, just to summarize it, the Most High commanded Moses um, to tell the children of Israel to go scout out the land of Canaan. And this is what they found. So it reads, And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But then the men that went up with him said, we be, able, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they have um, searched search unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And there we saw the giants and the sons of Anak which come from the giants and we were in our own sights as grasshoppers and so we were in their sights once again a lot of the different offshoots of the sons of ham that were always known for having for being a well tall people great in stature and when the term and when the term giant is used it's not talking about 380 feet tall people it's talking about people like between the feet um the height of like 7 to 12 feet tall for example if any of you brothers was to stand was um, to stand next to Shaquille O'Neal, you would consider him a giant. And the term giant can also be used um, for tyrant, dictator, or mighty man. Another example, I'm sure you brothers know about um, David and Goliath. Now, Goliath was a Philistine, and the Philistines um, are offshoot of the Canaanites. For whatever reason. Ham's, descend Ham's descendants were always just some, um, tall people. So going back to the Hamitic people, so-called black people, ye children of Israel, these are not your people. The only thing that we have in common with them is skin complexion. You tell people apart by the deity, by the deity that they worship, their laws, their customs, the holidays that they celebrate and how they dress. Now look at the dude at the bottom. Now this is what we would call scarification. Now they use scarification to worship the dead um, when, they reach, when they reach manhood and, dif and the different gods that they worship. So now we're going to get Leviticus. So this is Leviticus 19.28 and it reads, Ye shall not make any cottons in your flesh for the dead nor print any marks upon you, I am the Most High. And this is what the other nations were doing round about, the other, the of the different dark races of people. Once again, there's no such thing as the black race, but there is such thing as different races of dark skinned people. So artistic license, what is artistic license? So it reads, image results for artistic license. Artistic license means an artist is accorded leeway in his or her interpretation of something and is not held strictly accountable for accuracy. I'm gonna run that back. His or her interpretation of something and is not held strictly accountable for accuracy. So what does that mean? They give themselves permission to lie about any historical figure. They paint the likeness of their images. Brothers, whenever you hear the term Renaissance, remodeled, refurbished, restored, that is just cold word for whitewashing. So now I'm going to um, show you guys an example of artistic license. Brothers, Every single image that you see here is fake. They paint the likeness of their images. Brothers, not a single medieval king should be Caucasian. They all were so-called black men. But this is the type of imagery 
that you see once again in the Hollywood movies, the TV shows, the history textbooks, the documentary channels, so on and so forth. The whole history is based on lies, manipulation and deceit. It's the only way that they can rule. And this is how they do it. Look at this brothers. This image speaks a thousand words. What these people do, they hire professional artists to remodel, refurbish, whitewash, paint over, so on and so forth of historical images. So don't let them fool you when they tell you the images, the images got dark over time. As you can see in this image, he is literally whitewashing them. And as you can see in the background, the original images are of so-called black men. This is what they do throughout the whole world. It's not just the Israelites, it's the other dark races of people they, that, that they do this to. I mean, look at this. The lengths knows no bound. Brothers, do not be surprised that the, um, that the lengths that they will go to to eradicate so-called blacks from history. And just some of the, and just some of the different ways they alter um, images. Um, they get a very thin paintbrush and say like if um, a painting has a woolly hair texture, what they will do, they will draw like thin lines or thin circles around the hair to give off the illusion that that person has quote unquote straight hair. And you see a lot of this in the Byzantine icons. Now don't get it twisted, all so-called black people do not have woolly hair like that. But this is one of the tactics that they use. Let's take a look, let's take a look at another image. Here is another example of them hiring professional artists to quote unquote remodel, refurbish, revitalize, restore images. Now as you can see in the background in the background brothers, now if you're on your phone you may not be able to see this, but I've um I've, I've drawn a circle around and I've, uh, I've pointed three hours next to it. In those images are the original dark fleshed people. But you see how this lady is quote unquote remodeling the images. Brothers, one more time, remodel, refurbish, renaissance, restored, all is cold word for whitewashing. We're going to paint these images like us. So the house of Plantagenet, royal house. The house of Plantagenet was a royal house which originated from the lands of Anjou in France. The family, the family held the English throne from 1154 to 1485 when Richard III died in battle. Under the Plantagenet, England was transformed. Now I'm bringing this up because I'm going to use the time period of the Plantagenet to show you guys um, examples of when they do a piss poor job of whitewashing images. So to the left is Joan Holland, Duchess of Brittany. In the middle is Henry Beaufort, Cardinal, Bishop of Winchester. And to the right is Lady Eleanor Briagem, a don't hate me trying to pronounce it in a French dialect. And she was a um, Duchess of Somerset. So now brothers, take a good look at these images. As you can see, they've been altered, especially in the face. Look at all their faces. Their faces have this dark, greyish, smudging effect. Now one more time, they're going to tell you the reason why they're like that is because it got burned by chimney smoke or it got burned by incense in the monasteries. And as we all know, that's a complete lie. They've tried to whitenize the images, but these ones didn't come out as good, especially the one to the right. Brothers, take a look at um, Lady Eleanor. Now look at her hands. Her hands are white, but her face has that grayish smudges tint to it. Now why isn't her hands the same complexion as her face? One more time, brothers, never underestimate the lengths that these people will go to to eradicate so-called black people from history. Now I'm going to show you some images where they have not altered, where they have not been altered or they've done extremely, extremely piss poor job of, of doing it. So starting to the left, number one is Richard II, Duke of Normandy. Number two, is Robert I, Duke of Normandy. Number three is Edward Plantagenet, Prince of Wales. And last is Berengaria of Navarre, Queen of England. Now take a good look at these. These seem to have 
a bit more color to them, don't they? They probably just left these in the basement too long and over time, it was hard to remove the dust off their face or something. You know, the only logical explanation for this. Now all of these will have been originally darker than they are presented here, but these images still have more color to them. So I'm going to take some of the images, the real images of the Black Nobles and compare them to the fake, whitewash, artistic licensed counterpart. So we're going to start off with um, Berengaria, Queen of England. And as you can see, the difference between the real and the fake. As I'm sure you guys know, this is Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. The real version and the artistic licensed version. James Francis Edward Stuart, the son of King James II. King John the Sixth of Portugal. Peter the Great Holy Roman Emperor Leopold the First Albert of Prussia, the first Duke of the Duchy of Prussia, the 37th Grand Master of the Teutonic Knights. Elizabeth Stuart, Queen of Bohemia, the daughter of King James. Edward VI, King of England and Ireland. Speaking of Edward VI, his father, King Henry VIII. And Maria of Austria. Holy Roman Emperor Charles V's daughter. So now people, we're going to take a look at the different fables, narratives, stories and lies that these people come up with to explain away so-called black people from history. So this dude commented on one of my Russian icon videos. So let's see what he has to say. So he states, the icons can grow darker through aging and in many cases, the incense and candle smoke. Now, you see why I always make mockery about, it, about how it got dark over time or it got left in the basement or it got burnt by chimney smoke. This is what I'm referring to. This is one of the favorites they love to go uh, love to go to. But let's continue. So the incense and candle smoke in the churches and monasteries can have a darkening effect. Once again, it goes back to that. It got dark over time narrative. So I taught English in Istanbul, Constantinople, and spent time in Greece. So I've seen many icons in person. I saw zero evidence Byzantine was a black civilization. Mary Hill Museum in Washington State has one of the largest Russian Orthodox icon collections. Sorry, no evidence there. The Ethiopian Orthodox do have icons of black saints. Blacks lived in Constantinople as citizens, but as a minority, they didn't rule. There's a big difference seeing them in real life versus a photo of a photo of them. Hey, I guess that's it. 
As I said, he stated he taught English in, in Istanbul. So I guess that means he has a high IQ. He probably also has a PhD and I don't know, graduated Harvard. So everything that this dude says is correct. So let's go on that narrative guys. Let's go on the narrative that the icons got dark over time. So let's take a look at some of them. So people, this is the transfiguration of Christ. And it seems the incense smoke seemed to only affect his face, his hands, and his feet. All the parts where it shows his skin complexion. Isn't that funny? I never knew smoke can be so selective. But guys, take a good look, take a good look at his garments. As you can see, his robes are still purely white. So you gotta ask yourself a question. How come the incense smoke didn't target his robes? How come his robes or garments didn't get dark over time? One more time, the only places that seem to have got dark over time is his face, his hands and his feet, all the parts where it shows his skin complexion. So this icon here, and it looks to be the most high on Christ. Now take that with a grain of salt because this is a graven image. When our people were in rulership, they were bugged out, especially the pagan Romans. So I just want to reiterate so-called black people, do not, make, do not make images of Christ and the Most High and put them up on the wall and worship them. That will be a graven image and that will go into idolatry. But one more time, take a good look at his, at his robes. As you can see, the robes, his garments are purely white. And it seems the darkening effect only seemed to affect once again the face and the hands all the parts where it shows their skin complexion. So how come the darkening effect didn't, didn't seem to affect their garments or anywhere else in the photo? As you can see the two figures on, um, on the top, they're, um, they're holding out um, white scrolls. How come these scrolls or pieces of paper didn't get dark over time? How come it only seems to be the part where it shows their skin complexion? Now, of course, that's rhetorical, but we all know. Oh, and also look at the bird or the dove. How come the bird or the dove didn't get dark over time? As you can see, the bird is still white. Hmm. Now take a good look at this icon here. Now I think this is supposed to be the resurrection of Christ, but don't quote me on that. But look at this. There's no getting around this image. As you can see, everybody in this image is so-called dark skinned. Not so-called, they're just dark skinned. And brothers, this is how all the original paintings should be this dark. This is what they look like when they, when they have not been whitewashed or altered. Hey, you know what? Maybe this image got dipped in chocolate and they couldn't get the chocolate stains out. Who knows? So here's another icon. Now there's no point of me going through anymore because I've literally made compilations of the russian slash byzantine icons as some of you guys have probably already seen but since we're on the subject of the Byzant uh, byzantine why don't we get constantine the great himself so this is constantine the great and as you can see it's been partially whitenized or lightened now i'm going to read what it says at the bottom from the real history ww so it reads Painting of Constantine the Great, Roman Emperor, <clears throat> excuse me, Roman Emperor and Christian Saint of the Orthodox Church, from icon depicting the cross of Key, a replica, a replica of the true cross with holy relics commissioned by Nikon, Orthodox, Orthodox Patriarch of Moscow in 1656, circa 1670s, house in the State Museum of the History of Religion, religion, St. Petersburg. But as you can see, this image has been lightened. So let's see if we can find an image that hasn't been altered. So credit to Lord Worthy on Pinterest. He managed to find an image of Constantine and his mother, Helen, 
and as you can see they're both so-called black. So when so-called black people make the claim that a historical figure was so-called black, we're going to see how the Caucasian tries to debunk it. So listen to this. So this is about Joan of Arc. So it reads, No contemporary and near contemporary depictions show her as having a dark complexion. Okay, whatever you say. But by the standards of the time, that simply indicates that she was out in the sunlight for far more than the custom was for noble ladies. Now you see what they're doing. This person, this person, Justin, is basically saying the reason why she's described as dark, or if there's any historical documentation describing that she is dark, it's because she was out in the sun too long. This goes into that tan Caucasian narrative. So let's continue. This is perfectly understandable as a peasant she would have worked out she, she would have worked out of doors when needed these people just make things up make things up as they go along so when you go on these forums 99.9% .9 of people do not know what they're talking about but occasionally you're going to find a diamond in the rust and this is the diamond so we're going to read what Paul Barrington has to say so he states you decide for yourself i added some commentary after the references that may give some context. You will find documentation stating she is white, but you will also find the opposite, particularly brown, and significantly so. There should not be anything like this to be found unless there is a serious discrepancy that needs to be addressed about the people of Europe. Nobody who answered this question provided any references. They all just dismissed the possibility because they don't know any better to ever consider it, let alone conduct in-depth and honest research. Couldn't have, said, but couldn't have said better myself. So see, it is a strongly conditioned assumption that she and all Europeans of history are white. And if they are black, they must be slaves foreigners and that goes into the slave narrative everything so-called black has to be a slave and white equals slave master and that's how the elite have taught history all so-called black people ever were were slaves so all ancient civilizations inventions so on and so forth so, so on and so forth must all be all started and pioneered by Caucasians is an automatic automatic default. You know, if they managed to find a new civilization today, they're just going to assume that civilization was Caucasian just for the sake of it. But history has been flipped reverse. So-called black people were the rulers and the Caucasians are the original slaves. And as I've stated, I'm going to be doing a full video on the Caucasian during medieval Europe, but since we're on the topic, Let's go quickly pro prove the evidence. So this is what the Caucasian delved into, the wild man and wild woman. When so-called black people gained back dominion in the early 100 ADs, they drove them back to the Caucasus Mountains. And for those that they didn't drove um, back to the Caucasus Mountain, they kept as slaves. But for those that they drove to the Caucasus Mountain and the woods, they delved into a beast-like state called the wild man. And as you can see here, you see the wild man, the wild woman, and the child in a cave, outside the cave, I should say. And you see the castle behind them. That castle would, would have been inhabited by so-called black people. Now they're going to tell you that images like these are myths for obvious reasons, because it's the most depraved state the Caucasian has ever been in. But as I've stated, everything has just been flipped reverse. This is why they teach you that you had to be civilized. That they, had to, that they had to teach you how to read and write. That you were running, running around naked on all fours. Brothers, sisters, that was them. So guys, here are two examples of the Slav or the Woodwalls, the what slash wild men, holding up the coat of arms of their black rulers. Now you have to ask yourself a question. If the Caucasian was in rulership during these time periods, why would he present himself in this way? As you can see, he's naked 
hairy all over, hairy all over, and is holding up the coats of arms of so-called black people. Now you see why I tell you everything has just been flipped reverse. This is why they tell you when you see coats of arms with so-called black men and black women on them, they're going to tell you that those are conquered black African slaves that Caucasians put on the coats of arms. One more time, the Caucasian was in servitude. So this is a more real life example of what they would have looked like. Guys, when you see these TV shows, movies or documentaries about the caveman, they're going to tell you that the caveman is like a hundred million years old. That was them during the medieval time period, guys. But he's always going to hyperinflate numbers to fabricate history. Do not think that the caveman is a million years old. So the term Slav. So the term slave has its origins in the word Slav. The Slavs who inhabited a large part of Eastern Europe were taken as slaves by the Muslims of Spain during the 9th century AD. And those Muslims were so-called black people, by the way. You know, the Moors of Spain and Portugal and then Verdinand took over, who was also a so-called black man. They were all so-called black. They were just following different religions. So slavery can broadly be described as the ownership, buying and selling of human beings for the purpose of forced and unpaid labour. And once again, they even still, to this day, they go by the term Slavs. So going back to Paul's comment, see, it's a strongly conditioned assumption that she and all Europeans of history are white, and if they are black, they must be slaves slash foreigners, because that is what they are told since birth. This society makes sure it's reinforced in schools, pop culture, college, TV, movies, etc. And since it's not questioned in any genuine, meaningful or lasting way, it's the only thing that they can believe because that's what's told and accepted to be true. You see how that works? It's a truly vicious cycle that comes at that person's expense and limits their perception. What's outside of them starting from within? Some people described below are not Joan, but they are family, friends, commoners or nobility and are in those books about her and are relevant to her story and my overall point. I've only used a few books and there are more references, but you have to dig. So we're going to take a look at the references that Paul has provided for us. Page four to five, St. John of Arc, Sackville, Victoria W, 1936. Those who describe her from either first or second hand knowledge give on a whole a consistent picture. Her hair, they say, was short and black. Her complexion, dark and sunburn, as might be expected. The author of the first part of King Henry the M6 makes her refer to herself as black and swart. We're gonna jump down. None of, none of these witnesses mention her eyes, but there is on racial grounds a strong presumption in favor of their having been brown. The Doc de Alacon, who, ha who had often slept beside her while on, a, while on the campaigns, this duke is described as black slash brown. And last but not least, page 108, Joan of Arc, James Grace, 1910. The time's been ripe. There was not lacking any ambitious spirit, anxious to profit by the opportunities presented. In the month of May, 1436, there appeared, there appeared at a place called Lagrange, Orcs, Ormes, near Metz, a young woman calling herself the Maid of France and asking to speak with various lords of the town who happened to be there, who happened to be there, who she was, where she came from, who brought her, these things remain unknown, but it seems that her real name was Claude. She appeared to be about 25 years of age, was strong, of a brown complexion, tall and in a man's dress, and had been the real Joan of Arc. But we're going to choose to ignore this um, documentation and we're just going to assume the reason why she was called brown or dark is because she was, she was outside too long and she got a tan. 
Page 12 to 64, Joan of Arc, Milton Waldman, 1935. Sometimes it was noticed that she quietly disappeared from the midst of her games, and a playmate who marked what she then did call it, drawing apart and speaking with God. On Saturdays, she would choose up the hill to offer a candle in the chapel of Our Lady Beaumont. And on feast days, she would go even further afield. Every holy day, place within reach, however, ob however obscure or unfrequented, known the strudy, brown-faced, black-haired child. Now you guys get the point. I'm not going to read the rest. You guys can read this in your own time. Just pause the video. So now we're going to take a look at their explanation on Kenneth the nigger. And yes, that's how it's pronounced. It's not Niger and it's not Niger. It's pronounced nigger. So it reads, firstly, how did a Pictish king come to be black? There is no mention of his father, Malcolm I, being black. So at most, he could only have been mixed race. Nor is there any mention of his son, Kenneth III, being black or mixed race. Secondly, A-I-U-I, while the adjective dub literally translate as black, when added to a person's name, it refers to their hair. Now guys, this is why you always hear me make mockery when it's talking about black, when it's talking about Swarvy or Tony. They're going to say it's talking about their hair color. They did the same thing with Anne Boleyn. All, the, all those references to Anne Boleyn being a um, dark-skinned woman, they said that it's just talking about her hair, her hair color. So someone with black skin would be referred to as Grom. Grom is usually translated as blue, but is but is also the colour of grass. Gaelic does not divide the spectrum into the same colours as English. So here's another one from Claire Jordan. Very unlikely. Black in traditional Scots means either that a person is swarthy with black hair or that they belong to the black steps of a clan which is divided and as some are into black and red steps. Guys, I've seen all types of narratives that they come up with. It's because it's talking about how black their hair was, their shields were black, their armour was black, their shoes were black. They were called dark or black because how evil they are. But you have to understand how these people have been taught. They've always been taught that the Caucasian is the original man. He is the pioneer of all ancient civilizations. He is the great inventor, the philosopher. He is the king, he is the duke, he is the aristocrat. He is all the mighty soldiers of history. He is all the historical figures and all so-called black people ever were, were slaves unto him. These people are just low-level Caucasians regurgitating narrative. Afrocentrics make up a bunch of ridiculous when it comes to the different cultures. Kenneth the nigger is from the line of the Pictish kings called the House of Alpin. None of them were black. Yes, let's just choose to ignore the fact that he was called the nigger. This is why it's important to know the meaning of words, but that's either here nor there. The reason why the reason why I'm highlighting this comment is because he used the term Afrocentrics, and a lot of you so-called black people, you guys do do a lot of damage because you pigeonhole dark-fleshed people to the continent of Africa. For example, if you found a relic or an artifact in the Americas, an Incan art artifact, you're gonna say, look, black Africans were the Incas. Or the Incas were black Africans. If you found an artifact in China of a black man, you're going to say, look, black Africans are the original Chinese. If you find European artifacts, you're going to say, look, black Africans were the original Europeans. Because a lot of you guys call everything black African. What you have to understand, so-called black equals Aboriginal and indigenous. When you see artifacts scattered throughout the earth, what you are looking at is the indigenous and Aboriginal inhabitants of those lands. Stop calling everything black African. I'm going to go into more detail on Kenneth the nigger in a future video, most likely when I bring out my meaning of words video part two. But with that being said, uh, um, earlier on in the video, I stated the reason why they say the noses have been broken off is due to bad weather. But they have also stated that they say that for religious purposes. So we're going to read this article here. So the title it reads, Why do Egyptian statues have broken noses? The mystery has left archaeologists and history enthusiasts scratching their heads for decades. In the world of ancient Egypt, 
statues were an integral part of their culture. Admits the grand architecture that ranged from lavish palaces to wonders like the pyramids were statues of nobles and pharaohs for all the dynasties that ruled. These statues, however, followed a trend that has left archaeologists and history enthusiasts scratching their head for decades, a case of broken noses. For as, for as many statues in pristine conditions, there will be ones that show signs of decay, specifically in one particular area, the nose. Some would surprisingly be in excellent condition except for one flaw, a broken nose. From conspiracy theories, now you see what this person's already doing. They're already injecting the conspiracy theory narrative whenever you question anything, but we're going to continue. So from conspiracy theories about colonialism to political rivalry within the Egyptians as causes. This is, this is the enigma of Egyptian statues and their broken noses. Getting the conspiracy out of the way. Many people who have read into the case of missing or defaced noses in Egyptian statues believed it to be the work of European colonialism. It is said that this is an attempt to cleanse the statues of their African roots. The noses were broken as Africans have distinctive noses, which are their defining features. This theory, however, is entirely baseless and has no true value behind it. So you hear that guys? They have PhDs, they graduated Harvard, Yale, they went to the high, high Ivy League schools. What do you Negroes know about anything? Stop trying to steal other people's history with your stupid conspiracy theories. Why the heck would historians and archaeologists lie about things like this? And the fact that this person wrote, however, this is entirely baseless and has no true value behind it. Now you see how confident this person is, as if he has 100% 100% fact. Hey, but if a Caucasian says it, it must be true. But let's continue. Historians have critiqued this by pointing logical fallacies that claim that even if the noses were broken off, other features on the statue will still allow for um, association with the African roots. Features on the statue that were, weren't broken off, despite the horrors that colonialism brought upon the world, breaking European statue, breaking Egyptian statues, noses is Und um, undoubtedly not one of them once again what do you negroes know let me educate you guys a work of nature knowing that the europeans weren't behind this mystery okay whatever you say it is often speculated that this is nothing but um, merely a work of corrosion hey i guess it's that bad weather it's just been left out um, in the air too long and it corroded over time. Right guys? This theory, this theory is plausible as the noses of the statues are especially vulnerable, vulnerable because they stick out and air would affect them. The mo and air would affect them the most. Furthermore, there have been many identified cases where the natural causes like corrosion are the reason why a part of the face body of the statue is missing. Once again guys, it's that dang bad weather. However, all of these cases had signs of decay in multiple areas of the statue. The nose wasn't the only thing targeted. And uh, accomp uh, accompanying regions like the cheeks or torso of the statues were also damaged. Thus. Attribute, attributing the statues that specifically had only their nose broken off to natural causes is not very likely, considering that most of the statues were indoors where they would not be exposed to air, air, make, um, to air makes, this theory even weaker. And I'm glad you pointed that out. What about the statues that weren't, um, that were indoors and not exposed to bad weather? What about those? So now we're going to get to the religious person I was telling you guys about. So 
The, um, the ancient Egyptians viewed statues as living beings. The theory that does receive the most respect within academia. A, that doesn't mean it's true. And one more time, we all know how these people lie. It doesn't matter how much PhDs they have. It doesn't matter what school they went to. It doesn't matter what degrees they have. They are the biggest liars on the earth. But that, does, but that doesn't mean that there's no truth to this, but we're going to read. So, um, I'm going to start from the top again. The theory that does not receive, um, the, um, the theory that does receive the most respect within academia that discusses Egyptian history is that of um, iconoclasm and ancient Egyptians belief in the supernatural. Ancient Egypt was known for having a strict religious paradigm or paradigm, one which believed that individuals' life after death were preserved in statues. While, while they were aware that the statues couldn't move, they believed that people's life force when they died were transferred into their respective statues almost as if they were living beings to, effect, uh, to effectively eliminate this life force the Egyptians believed that they had to destroy the statues. Now, once again, brothers, it doesn't mean that there's no truth to this, but they're going to use this as a proxy to explain away why all the statues have broken noses. Because this is the perfect scapegoat. But let's continue. Hence, it is speculated that people who went to rob the tombs of the nobles and pharaohs would break off the nose of the statues first to effectively eliminate this life force as the statue wouldn't be able to breathe it sounds ridiculous to think that a statue um, can breathe but the egyptians firmly believed that the nose itself was the source of life for the deceased and breaking it was the only way that they would kill them all uh, that they would kill them once and for all this theory would explain why so many statues found at burial sites specifically had their noses chopped off with no other side of natural corrosion. Now, once again, it doesn't mean there's no that there's no truth to this, but they're going to use this as a proxy to explain away why all the noses have been broken off. The reason why the majority of noses on the Egyptian statues has been broken off is to hide their quote unquote quote unquote negroid features as i'm sure all you brothers already know where religious motives end political motives start although religious beliefs are strongly theorized to be the reason behind smash noses there were also political reasons for defacing these statues in the ancient egyptian world the dynasties that came before the current ruling one were often despised and were seen as inferior Hence, to solidify their dynasty as the superior one, most rulers would have their statues of previous pharaohs and rulers defaced. Now what this person stated is not wrong, but what these people do, they give you one truth and tell you ten lies at the same time. Brothers, this is the standard procedure for when, nation, uh, when a nation takes over another nation or civil war. You know, when a nation conquers another nation, the conquering nation is going to destroy the pre is going to destroy the previous nation's statues, artifacts, and relics, and put themselves up. That's just obvious. And for those of you that read script read the scriptures, when the Most High told His people to um, take over the land, and then He commanded them to destroy the statues and the um, pagan gods, it's nothing new, brothers. Of course, you're going to destroy the relics of the previous owners. But as I've stated, they're very manipulative. They give you one truth and tell you ten lies. And we're going to see what this person says at the end of this. So let's read on. Often, they would have entire statues broken with, severe, uh, with severed arms and legs and no remaining torso. In ancient Egypt, this signified the hatred expressed for those that came before the ruling party. This practice is often deemed synonymous with current politics, where propaganda 
might be used to tarnish the reputation of the previous governments or ruling parties in order to legitimize the current leader. For the Egyptians, defacing statues were the form of propaganda. Some causes of broken noses can be attributed to nature and some to simple human error where the statues were knocked over or mishandled. However, there is one growing consensus with the ancient Egyptian historical academia. These Egyptians were deeply religious people and intentionally broke the statues' noses to avoid the pharaoh's wrath while also showing their distaste for previous rulers by ordering these statues to be um, shattered. While the mystery of these statues could be solved with the ideas of iconoclasm and religious beliefs, here we go, it is clear that these broken noses are definitely not an attempt to whitewash the African race by Western colonialism. Now you see, they give you one truth and tell you 10 lies. Basically, what this person just stated, when another nation conquers another nation, they break the statues and the relics and the sculptures and the statues, you know, so on and so forth. That, and as I said, that's just standard. We all know this. But he just told a lie when he stated definitely not an attempt to whitewash the African race by Western colonialism. Now, that's the lie that he told or this person told. I think a woman wrote this article. But as I've stated, they rule through lies manipulation, deceit and subterfuge, subterfuge, they're very extremely good at, it, good at it. So on an off topic, you guys have to realize why our people are in the conditions that they are in today. Our ancestors made a covenant with the Most High because the Most High chose us. Unfortunately, our people did not stick to that covenant and a covenant is an agreement. And this is why we're under curses. And in your own time, you should go you, you should go read Deuteronomy 28 and read down. But in the end, everybody on this planet is going to know who we are and the reason why we went into captivity. So I'm going to read from Ezekiel 39, skipping down to 23. And the heathen shall know that the house of Israel, that's us, the so-called black man and woman, not those people over in that land, you know, you know who I'm talking about. So where Israel went into captivity for their iniquity because they trespassed against me. Therefore hid I my face from them and gave them into the hands of their enemies. So they all fell by the sword. According to the uncleanness and according to their transgressions, I have done unto them and hid my face from them. Therefore, thus saith Yahweh, now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon the whole, ho whole house of Israel and will be jealous for my holy name. After that, they have borne their shame and all their trespasses, whereby they have trespassed against me when they dwelt safely in their land and none made them afraid. When I have brought them again from the people and gathered them out of their enemies' lands and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations, then they should know that I am Yahweh, their power, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. But I, but I have gathered them unto their own land and have left none of them more, um, any more there. Neither will I hide my face any more from them, from them, for I poured out my spirit unto the house of Israel, says the Most High, saith the Most High. So once again, everybody is going to know who we are and why we went into captivity. And we're going to gain back rulership over the earth, of course, under Yahawashai. One more time, the Bible is not the white man's book. The Bible is our history book. So come back to the Most High, understand your culture, repent, and with that being said, giving all praises to the Most High Yahweh, and giving acknowledgement to Hamashiach Yahweh Shai. And I'm going to end this video off with a small compilation of the real artifacts.
Thank you. 